The hunger or the desire for people to be able to illuminate their surroundings, especially at night, has been there forever. Most of the world lived in darkness from dusk until dawn. Light was very rare, light was very expensive. It wasn't surprising that when electricity came on the scene, some individuals would start thinking about, well, how can we use this continuous electricity to create light? They knew what was at stake. There was a lot of money to be made. They may look the same, but the lights of today are almost nothing like those of yesterday. Because now it's all about LEDs, and they are completely taking over. In 2018, the LED lighting market was estimated to be worth almost $52 billion, and is expected to reach over $112 billion by 2024. Here's how we went from this to this. We enter the story around 1802. At that time, the world knew about electricity, but was just starting to understand how to control it. There were no power plants, houses didn't have electrical outlets, but there were batteries. The only power source uh, was batteries, and they weren't very good batteries. About the best thing they could do was power a telegraph. A 23-year-old British chemist named Humphrey Davy had one of those batteries. He um, performed some experiments using platinum. He connected the platinum across the voltaic pile and it would heat up and before it melted, it would produce a bright light. So he's generally credited with really the first to create artificial electric light. So in 1802, Davy realized that if you hook up certain kinds of metals to a battery, they glow for a while before they melt. Then in 1806, he showed that if you put two pieces of carbon close together and run enough electricity through them, the current will arc through the air and also create light. But he's limited by how weak these batteries are. So 25 years pass, and in 1831, one of Humphrey Davy's former assistants, Michael Faraday, discovers electromagnetic induction and creates the first generator. Suddenly, we can create electricity on demand. Developments that happened during the mid-19th century improved on those devices to the point where they could actually produce enough power that could be useful for running motors or potentially for electric light. The first practical electric lights are based off of Davy's 1806 carbon arc lamp. They use massive amounts of energy and produce massive amounts of light. It wasn't until early, you know, 1850, 1840, we started seeing this in street lighting and area lighting, but it was extremely bright light source. It was very difficult to manage. It was expensive. Which is suitable if you're lighting up a town square, uh, but really not if you're trying to read by it. <laughs> it's a, a bit intense. Work continues on heating something to create light, which is called incandescent lighting, but it's slow going. They have power now, but still can't figure out how to make a lamp that doesn't melt or burn out quickly. There's a missing piece. Sometimes the invention just has to wait. It has to wait for the technology to catch up with it. And that's the case with the light bulb. The one thing that was missing was a good vacuum pump. And in order to keep carbon from oxidizing and burning up, or to keep the platinum from melting. You needed to have a vacuum and a good vacuum. And in 1865, German chemist Hermann Sprengel invents the mercurial air pump, which gives scientists the ability to remove air from a bulb much more efficiently and helps stop their filaments from burning up. During this period of time, there were a number of different inventors that were working on different technologies, but it wasn't really until Joseph Swan that there was a serious contribution that ended up being carried forward. In 1878, British physicist and chemist Joseph Swan was 50 years old and had been thinking about electric lights for decades. He'd recently returned his focus to them after the debut of these much-improved vacuum pumps. Swan built a lamp that uh, used a carbonized cotton thread in a vacuum, and he was able to get that to light and incandesce for quite some time. That was really, I think, most historians recognize as being kind of the, the first real significant milestone in the development of the incandescent lamp. At the same time, in the United States, Thomas Edison started working on electric lights. At the time when Edison was working on his electric lamp, he was already the Wizard of Menlo Park. He was very well known by the public. He had already invented the phonograph. He had invented the quadrature telegraph. Edison's first attempt at a lamp used a platinum filament, similar to what others had used. And he came to the same conclusion that even in a vacuum, it just required too much power to, to light this thing. And it's important to take a step back and realize that we're almost 80 years into the story of light bulbs, and Edison has just now shown up. One thing you can say about Edison, and he didn't invent things just to invent them, he invented them to make a business out of it. So the economics of the electric lamp was an important factor in his thinking. So he swapped his original platinum filament for carbon, much like Swan's lamp used. That then he put inside an evacuated glass enclosure, 
they were expecting it might last a few hours and it ended up burning for two days, uh, which for a light bulb at the time, that was quite an accomplishment. Edison knew he wasn't the only person working on carbon filament electric lamps, and he wanted patent protection. So he quickly applied for one, and it was approved in late January 1880. Then he announced his invention to the world. The first reaction by the scientific community was the whole thing was a hoax. Despite that, the public went crazy over it. It must have seemed fantastical because light was contained within a glass tube. There was no visible flame. I can't even imagine what it must have been like to encounter that as an adult. All of the components that went into Edison's 1879 bulb already existed in one form or another elsewhere. He did not invent a light bulb, but he did make one that worked well and created a commercially viable system to go along with it. The thing we have to keep in mind is that hardly any one person invents any one thing. Any of the major electrical inventions I can think of all dependent upon contributions from a broad range of people. Edison was really the genius that was able to uh, take it from lab to marketplace. And we sort of saw a rapid evolution of uh, commercially viable lamps. The gas stocks for lighting all plunged. The Edison stock went up dramatically and the public embraced it rapidly. Light bulbs were suddenly a business and Edison was leading the industry. Problem was that Edison didn't quite have all the kinks worked out yet, but he did have a great patent. And his patent, despite the attempts of many others to enter the market, protected his business very effectively. So he was really the only game in town in the early 1880s in terms of incandescent lighting. And this is one of the challenges, in fact, that others had in entering the market. Westinghouse decided that he wanted to compete in the electrical market. And so he began selling electrical devices and electric lamps and was immediately sued by the Edison company, and uh, they won. So he was not allowed to compete. Others eventually found ways to enter the market, mostly because of Edison's focus on direct current and not the eventually more successful alternating current. But Edison remained the public face of electric lighting. But he hit a snag when he applied for an additional patent in the UK, because Joseph Swan already had a patent there. So Edison ended up suing Swan for infringement and the suit was not successful. <laughs> and so they ended up forming a joint venture called Ediswan, the two companies. So any uh, Edison lamps that were sold in, in Great Britain, and actually mostly in Europe, were produced by Ediswan. But Edison's legacy is the one that endured, and his name was tied to electric light as the world embraced it. Once the lights came, people would turn on every light in the house, and then they would drive away from the house just to be able to look back at it and see what it looked like fully illuminated. It was a life-changing event, just this flick of a switch. The lights really didn't mean so much, and I think if you just flip a switch and you got all the lights on, you don't have to trim any more greasy oil in weeks, you don't have to wash any more sudden globes and things for your lamps. Edison saw lighting as an urban invention. He first imagined lighting, say, New York City, the streets, the commercial districts, the homes of the wealthy. Only in the 1930s and 40s did much of rural America see electric light. And many of the poorer sections of cities didn't have electric light for a corresponding amount of time. In the early 20th century, work was focused on improving existing bulbs to make them more robust and last longer. But for the most part, they didn't stray too far from Edison's 1879 design. Light bulbs were such a big deal that in 1925, several major light bulb manufacturers, including General Electric and Philips, formed what became known as the Phoebus Cartel. It existed to control the price of light bulbs and limit their lifespan to a thousand hours, even though bulbs of the time could last much longer than that. It was one of the very first examples of broad-scale planned obsolescence. Around the same time lights like Edison's were taking off, a new kind of light was being developed, fluorescent. It started with sending an electric current through a gas, making it glow like in neon lights. But these lamps gave off strongly colored light, and much of the energy was emitted as invisible ultraviolet light, and as a result, they weren't all that useful. Eventually, a phosphor coating was added to the inside of the bulb, which converted that invisible ultraviolet light to visible light, and the modern fluorescent light was born. These are the predecessors of the long tubes still lighting many office buildings today. The fluorescent lamp got introduced at the World's Fair in New York in 1940. Here was a light source that created a lot of light with high efficacy, high brightness, uh, relatively inexpensive. 
So in the 40s and 50s, we started seeing the introduction of this commercially, and it started to slowly displace in the 50s incandescent lamps. So here, the marketplace bifurcated. We saw incandescent almost exclusively in re residential and commercial, it's all fluorescent. Fluorescent lights were bigger and more efficient, while incandescent lights were cheaper. Motivated by the 1973 oil crisis and a desire for a bulb that used less energy, the compact fluorescent bulb showed up in 1976. The idea was simple. Take a fluorescent tube and twist it up into something the size of an incandescent bulb. The problem was compact fluorescent doesn't produce the kind of color or have the performance attributes that people are used to. So all of a sudden we had compact fluorescent lamps on the marketplace that were 10 times as expensive. The color was a little weird, a little strange. It didn't dim nicely, but it lasted a long time and gave a great energy savings. And so what we did, we spent the 90s and a large portion of the, from you know, 2000 to 2007, encouraging consumers to use compact fluorescent with rebates, with government programs, a lot of money, time, energy, education spent on this, but unfortunately it didn't work well. The government pushed CFLs because they saved money in energy, but they ultimately couldn't compete with the quality of light that an incandescent bulb is capable of. If we take a step back to the 1960s, when incandescent bulbs are already in most houses and fluorescent bulbs are in most office buildings, scientists were working out yet another technology, light-emitting diodes, or LEDs, a type of solid-state lighting. And LEDs create light in an entirely new way. An LED is a semiconductor diode. And there are many kinds of diodes. There is a solar cell diode, which takes light, such as sunlight, and converts it to electrical current that can, say, power your home. Certain diodes, when you put electrical current in, can actually emit light. And depending on the exact configuration of the light, you can generate particular colors. So the process of making an LED starts with a wafer. And on that wafer, we will grow our semiconductor device structure. And we put it in a machine where we can atomically deposit layer by layer by layer and create the semiconductor device. After that, you have one big circular slab of LED material. All that's left is placing thousands of electrical contacts on it and cutting them into individual pieces. These pieces are all individual LEDs and are what you run electricity through to get light. But when they were first developed, LEDs were not terribly bright, and the kind of light you could create with them was limited. In 1968, the first mass-produced visible light LEDs entered the market, first by Monsanto, followed by Hewlett Packard. Yes, the huge farming subsidiary was once in the business of light. And they went into calculators and little small LED signals. Then as time went on, we found ways to make the LEDs much more powerful and efficient and in different colors. One place they weren't, though, was in light bulbs. That's because at that time, scientists were struggling to create high-quality white light with them. And it centered around one thing, an inability to create blue LEDs. To produce white light in an LED, you have two fundamental options. One, you can mix red, blue, and green, the same way painters do. The other is you take a blue-emitting pump and you add through phosphor conversion, those other colors to create white. And in general illumination, the latter is the overwhelming majority of how the LEDs are produced. Blue LEDs were a huge challenge to make, and really it was Suji Nakamura that had a breakthrough. I honestly remember sitting at my desk, I was an engineer, and someone from R&D came running down with a paper that was published and said, look at this, they made the brightest blue LED that is actually going to be competitive. And it was a shock because big companies had been working on it and it really broke the barriers. And then everyone jumped on board and started getting into this indium gallium nitride technology. But you needed that blue LED in order to really expand the lighting space and be able to do the white conversion. In 2014, Suji Nakamura, along with Isamu Akasaki and Hiroshi Amano, won a Nobel Prize in Physics for the invention of efficient blue light-emitting diodes, which was work they did in the early 90s. It was this breakthrough that fundamentally changed what could be done with LEDs. We were able to do all the things that you could do with compact fluorescent, but in a smaller package, 
with a little bit more control on the potential for, for color. What we've done is we've taken a blue light that's about the size of a grain of salt and then put a phosphor on it and convert the blue light to white light. And that's a complete game changer. And that allows you to do all kinds of novel designs. You can also drop it and it will still work. So it's extremely robust and it's highly energy efficient. The other very nice part about LED lightings is the lifetime. A typical bulb may last um, incandescent bulb a year. A typical CFL might last five years, but LED bulbs are rated at 20 years. Part of the early hurdle to adoption was you had many companies that were producing traditional light bulbs where a big part of their business model was the fact that these bulbs only last a certain period of time and then they have to be replaced. Unlike fluorescent, it's relatively easy to tweak, to adjust, to make a color spectrum that mimics very closely incandescent or daylight characteristics. So in 2015, we saw the first commercial availability of high color quality LED lamps that would truly replace incandescent lamps. So LEDs are taking over, and it's because LED lighting offers almost all the benefits of older lighting techniques and fixes almost all their problems. They're more efficient than any other type of lighting, and their efficacy continues to grow. In just the last 10 years, white LEDs have become 330% more efficient. The quality of their light is very high. You can control their brightness and color. You can easily make them smart and incorporate them into rooms in ways previously impossible. And their price is steadily going down. At some point, we will approach an asymptote in terms of just how efficient this technology can be. We're not there yet. There's a lot of innovation that's still going to happen in our industry. We have not come across anything yet that indicates for illumination applications that there's a technology that would replace LED. There's no obvious successor to it at this point in time. Today, LEDs are in light bulbs, street lights, and office lights. They're lighting up the screen on your cell phone and powering its flash. They're in TVs, cars, and traffic signs. They're the reason your Apple Watch knows your heart rate. They are everywhere. What's interesting to me is how the incandescent bulb took on a glow of nostalgia. You know, you see in the upscale lighting catalogs the um, return to the look of the early bulb. Those bulbs are being sold for $15 each, and you can hang them without a, a shade. And, you know, so it's all part of this nostalgia for incandescence. Now, for a majority of the world, electric light is taken for granted. We're at a privileged place in the history of light bulbs, where the focus of much current research revolves not around just taking away darkness, but creating light that affects us in specific ways. We've got light, but is it good? Do I like it? And is that having an impact on me? So now we're getting into biology, and this is circadian lighting with the idea that the lighting is gonna impact my health. How does it make me more productive? How does it make me more comfortable? Uh, how does it contribute to my wellness? And at the end of the day, am I happier with this? I mean, that's ultimately how we're lighting spaces. If I wanna be really happy, I have daylight. But if I'm working inside in a hospital environment or I'm in a patient room or I'm in a classroom, um, I want that light to be the highest quality and I, and, I want, and I want it to be good for me. We're on the cusp of that now. 